What's up, what's up, and welcome back to my channel. I am so excited for today's video because this is something I have wanted to talk about for a really long time. I've been getting so many questions about, and that is how to start running. Okay, so for today's video, I'm actually gonna be collabing with my friend Alex, who's a chiropractor, who is a run coach, who's really good at running, and is also very smart, to break down the top three mistakes that people make when they're first trying to start running. And funny enough, these were actually three mistakes that I was making for several months, which would explain my lack of progress over the course of those months. Now, before we jump into the interview, I figured it would be helpful to give you a little bit of background on my running experience because I think a big misconception is that all runners start from the same place. All runners look the same. All runners are the same, right? And I think part of that is assuming that running is easy right from the get-go, that everyone just knows how to run and they get it from day one. But I can tell you from experience that is not the case. I think I first got back into running either this past December or this past January, sometime around then. And I got into running because I wanted to, wanted to trim up, get a little bit leaner, lose a little bit of weight, burn some fat. That was my goal with getting back into running. And I just decided running because that's an easy form of cardio to do. Keyword there was easy. I thought this was gonna be easy, okay? But on the first day that I decided, hey, I'm gonna just hop on the treadmill for a quick little 20 minute run, I got two minutes in at not even a fast running pace. This was just a little bit quicker than a jog. Two minutes in and I had to jump for dear life onto those side rails of the treadmill because I was wheezing for air. I was so out of breath. I did not know what hit me. I could not breathe. I felt like my lungs were jumping out of my chest and I, I just, I couldn't keep going. I, I don't know if there was any better way to describe it than absolute bewilderment. I just, it wasn't adding up for me. I, I worked out regularly. I looked fit. I thought I was fit. But that treadmill very clearly told me, no girl, you are not fit. And so it was right then that I decided, okay, I'm not just doing this for fat loss. I'm not just doing this to tighten up. This is a challenge and I am going to get good at running. I think a lot of people look at running as just something that we naturally do and something that we kind of take for granted. But as I've actually learned more about it, there are so many little intricacies and so many little things you can look at in terms of running form, in terms of running pacing, in terms of, I mean, even the types of shoes you wear. Like it's, it's very interesting to actually start to dig into it as this new activity to do and, and not just for fat loss, right? Before I get to rambling, let's get to this interview. I will warn you that the audio quality isn't great. I am new to recording with kind of two people on camera at the same time, but it is something I'm gonna work on. Um, so if you are excited for this video, Make sure you shoot me a thumbs up and also hit that subscribe button. Otherwise, let's get to the interview. All right, so jumping into our first mistake. So running, I think, is something that a lot of people associate with fat loss. Like when I was competing in bodybuilding, there was one judge who said, you look good, but before your next show, you got to do a lot more running because your legs are still too thick. Yeah. <laughs> and he was convinced that that was going to be the key to my fat loss. Right, right. So what do you think about that? What's what's your take on running as like a fat loss tool? You know, definitely expending energy is gonna really help with yeah. fat loss. Um, you just need to make sure that you have, uh, again, the strength requirements to be able to do some of these things that will lose your weight. So yeah. something like running actually takes a lot more strength than people uh, think. Why is it so important that you do have this prerequisite strength? Like you see a lot of these runners who are you know, skin and bones and you know, you wonder, okay, but I need strength to do this. Like, why is that? Is it something to do with the impact or is it something, you know, to do with your joints? Kind of what's the logic behind that? Yeah, so strength is just showing the ability to absorb an impact or absorb um, body weight as it hits the ground. Um, so your, your muscles really act as almost shock absorbers yeah. um, as you hit the ground. Um, shock absorbers that also, you know, they absorb impact, but then they propel you forward. Yeah. A big misconception is that strength and running don't go together, which while I understand the logic behind this, having a base level of strength is key if you want to stay injury free. A quick Google search will pull up hundreds of running strength tests, but I've put together a simple example on screen, listing the exercises and minimum number of reps you should be able to do. The reason strength is important is because like Alex said, muscles act as your natural shock absorbers. If you lack the muscle or muscle endurance to support your own body weight over time, that impact shifts from your muscles to your joints and other parts of your body that are much more likely to get injured. I list the full strength test down below, but this is something I recommend trying before you make the decision to even start running. So I guess in terms of form, what would you say? 
say are maybe like the top three mistakes that people make? Yeah, top three for sure. Um, one is overreaching. Yeah. Right? So instead of naturally letting the body fall forward, foot coming underneath the pelvis and the body, people tend to overreach with that front foot. Okay. Um, impact is a little more, um, you can cause things like shin splints. Okay, so what is overstriding? It can be characterized by having your ankle and dorsiflexion, your knee locked or near straight, and your hip inflection. Overall, your joints are not at an ideal angle for muscles to absorb the force. Because muscle length, angles, and various other factors change through the range of motion, muscle function at one position can differ from its function at another position. A key example of this is with the glute max muscle. This is your largest glute muscle that plays a key role in extending your hip and moving your leg behind your body. Problem is, this muscle can't do its job as well when you're in hip flexion. And so the further your foot lands in front of your body, the less glute max you're going to be able to use to pull your leg back, and therefore the less efficient your running stride is going to be. So something that really helped me was to actually focus on something called cadence. Cadence describes how many times your feet come in contact with the ground per minute, okay? So by speeding up how many steps you're actually taking to cover the same distance, your steps are gonna be inherently shorter. So the best way to track cadence if you're on a treadmill or if you have a watch is to wait for it to get to an easy to remember number, okay? So an example would be 40 here, or you could do 50, whatever you're gonna remember. And then for the next 15 seconds, you wanna track how many times your same side foot is hitting the ground, okay? So I usually use my right foot, and I'll count how many times that right foot hits the ground in 15 seconds. What you're gonna do from there is you're gonna multiply that number by four to get it to the full minute. Then you're gonna multiply it by two to get both legs. Okay, and in general, you want to aim for a cadence that's in the ballpark of 170 to 190, but really anything above 160 should be fine based on the current literature. Uh, it would be like overarching at the back. Mm -hmm. So instead of, again, naturally leaning forward with the spine, keeping a nice uh, neutral position, um, people tend to overarch their back, kind of pop their, exactly, pop their butt out a little bit more. Um, and we know that's just compensating for lack of being able to push your hips back. Yeah. Zeroing in on that low back arch, this is usually a consequence of anterior pelvic tilt, which describes a combination of tight quads, weak glutes, tight low back muscles, and weak core muscles. Now, similar to what we discussed with overreaching, your glutes will not be able to fire optimally at this joint angle, and as a result, your stride is going to be less efficient. From an injury prevention standpoint, your spine is designed to absorb impact. However, it's designed to do this when it's in a neutral position. And so when you start arching or hunching your back, you change the stress distribution throughout your spine, putting more stress on some areas and as a result, increasing your risk of injury. So focusing in on that overarching that I just showed you. So this was something that I think I really struggled with because growing up, I was always told you want to keep an upright posture. You want to pull your shoulders down and back. You want to keep your head and your chest up. And that's what I was trying to channel when I was running and I think as a result I probably didn't notice but that led me to puff my chest up and arch out my low back which wasn't really productive for running form. So instead what I found helpful is kind of like a running cue was rather than trying to be so upright all the time and be like this vertical board, what I was instead learning to focus on was the fall and then catch motion. Okay, so I'm going to speed up the treadmill I'm going to show you what I mean here. Fall then catch, fall then catch, fall then catch. That is a very overemphasized version of the form, but oftentimes when you just take a little cue in mind and you try to apply it, even though it may feel dramatic at first, it's going to result in something that's closer to proper form. Uh, another thing is if they're overly exuberant going into running, they'll, yeah. they'll bounce a little bit higher than they need to. Again, that energy that they're using to kind of balance up and down um, is not being directed forward. It's yeah. directing up and then back down into their new joints. More loading. Uh, exactly, <laughs> more, more loading. Yeah, and, and more, you know, more energy being used through the calves and through the Achilles, right? Understanding that your muscles don't just absorb force, but also create force, and it takes energy to do both. You want to maximize the amount of energy used for moving forward and minimize the amount of energy used for absorbing impact. The problem with vertical bounce is that it increases the amount of energy used to absorb impact between strides. Another way of looking at this is with the work equation. Work describes the total amount of energy it takes to apply a certain force across a certain distance. So in the case of vertical bounce, this means the energy required to slow your body down as you land between strides. And so as you can see, the larger the bounce, the larger the distance traveled, and the more energy it's going to take you to run. One cue that I find really helpful 
is if I focus on staying low and just kind of using my muscles to actively absorb the landing, right? Think of anything like stay low, stay quiet, land quietly. So I'll show you what I mean by this. I'll give you two quick examples. So springy, really jerky <laughs> versus staying low. So another mistake that I definitely made when I first started running again was not only did I want to run fast and be this Olympian high performing athlete, but I decided, you know, we should really start with a 5k run because people right. throw around, you know, 5k run, like fun 5k, fundraiser 5k, like it seems like this very chill yeah. thing, yeah, yeah. but when I actually went to start running, I quickly realized that I could not make it beyond about two minutes without yep. feeling like my lungs were going to leave my chest. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I guess I struggled with with overestimating my ability, but yeah. you know, what do you see in terms of this? Like, is this is this a common mistake? Um, you know, what's up? What's going on there? Yeah, a very common mistake. So you know, we, and we know something like a five k is going to take for a beginner anywhere from like thirty to forty five minutes. So um, you know, if you've never done a certain boot camp before, you know, from a weightlifting background, try doing something totally new for thirty to forty five minutes is pretty tough. Yeah. Um, so it, we usually you know tell people there's two variables: volume, aka distance, um, or or intensity or speed. Okay, so you want to choose like one of those two variables and slowly increase that over time. So instead of right from the get go going 5k, which is like Fast. way up here, you got to start a little bit lower. Um, you know, you can just go for like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe not even necessarily run the whole way. Do a bit of a split between a walk and a run at the same time. Digging into this walk run method, it sounds fancier than it is. It literally describes running and then walking. That's it. If you want to be a little more structured with your approach, we can build off of what Alex said about either changing distance or speed. I recommend setting a fixed distance, say three kilometers if you're just starting, and then using the walk-run method to build up your speed over time until you can run the entire three kilometers straight. Your first week, you might run for one minute, then walk for two, and repeat that until you complete the 3K. Two weeks later, you might run for two minutes, walk for two minutes, and repeat until you complete the 3K. You don't need to get fancy with the interval timing. Just make sure that you're gradually running more over time until you can complete the full distance running. That's when you know it's time to increase the distance and repeat this process again. Okay, <laughs> I just got back from my run, as you can probably tell from this sweaty, scraggly hair situation over here. But hopefully, after watching this video, you're ready to start thinking about maybe going on a run of your own. I would love to hear if you are going to start running, so definitely comment that in the comment section down below. But I really wanted to cover the top three mistakes first, because I remember when I first started running, I felt like every inch of my movement was wrong, like literally nothing was right about my running form. And so even if you take just one little tweak or one small form cue from this video, I will feel like I have done my job. So on that note, if you found this video helpful, make sure you shoot me a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. I would love to share more what I'm learning about running, more of the science behind running, all that good stuff with you. So if you would like to see that, definitely, you know, hit that button, hit that thumbs up. Otherwise, thank you for watching this video and I hope to see you in the next one.